the Drupal 6 core. Um, I don't think it was a political thing. I think it was just they were too invasive. Because uh, I believe most of those changes in Pressflow made it into Drupal 7. Um, but basically, Pressflow would, every time there's another Drupal release, they would take the patches from Drupal 6 and put it into the Pressflow and release a, a parallel track, keeping the uh, the improvements that they had put into it. And Silkscreen is basically doing the same thing. It's taking backdrop, added a bunch of features, and then every time the the core team releases a new version of of backdrop, I pull in those patches, run some tests on them, make sure everything still works. Um, sometimes kick back some patches and put out a release of my own. So anytime that you're using backdrop, if you need one of these features, it should be more or less a, a drop in replacement. And in fact, there's very few places that you would even notice a, a change outside of like you know, some branding at the bottom here. Um, one of the big things that it adds is it reintroduces support for Postgres and SQLite uh, on top of the MySQL stuff. And you know, this is uh, the same VM, it's just running with a in fact, it's even running the same code base. I've got it in the sites directory for a PGSQL. Um, and it just, if you didn't know that it was Postgres under the covers, you probably wouldn't even notice. So, uh, sorry if I missed this, but what was the motivation for forking fork in this case? The reason for forking it? Um, well, you can go back and read through the uh, the comments, and, and there's a couple GitHub issues on it. Uh, initially, I wanted to put the configuration into the database for a couple different reasons, uh, scalability and sort of security as well. Oftentimes, the database can be behind an extra firewall, and keeping all this, the configuration back there just makes the security guys feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, that meant splitting config storage into two different classes and getting it to run you know, whichever one you're, you're configured up with. And that was not the direction that the project, that backdrop project wanted to go. So rather than just, you know, I could keep a bunch of patches and just try to keep up with the patches. But once you do that, then you put into a new repository, you put into a new repository, it needs a name, and once you have a name, you've got a project. It's a fork. So and, it and started these things, with... These things could not be implemented as modules that, that could be added to the main product. That's not right, right? You can't really put configuration in a database as a module because you, there's, you're running into a chicken and egg problem okay. of... Yeah. How do you know that you well, should be pulling it until you actually looked in the, the configuration? Yeah, 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 you're right. So that's that's where that happened. Uh, I implemented it as what we call drivers, and I'll show you that in a moment. Set this up real quick. And because I was setting up drivers, then I realized that I could also set up uh, database drivers and reintroduce Postgres and SQLite. Um, and I can also do this for some caching. And we'll see that in a moment as well. And one thing I've noticed with uh, screen sharing things, this is it's not unique to Zoom. Everything slows down. Yeah, yeah. It's a fact. Oh, yes. So yeah, this is the, the Postgres version. You go into reports, and it'll report the database version of you know Postgres 11. Um, but just about everything else here is you know exactly the same. Um, there are a couple of caveats when you're using either SQLite or Postgres. Uh, they do not support everything exactly the same way that MySQL does. Uh, in particular, I found that SQLite does not handle uppercase, lowercase sorting the same way that MySQL does. And so some of the tests that we have for uh, 
for backdrop that run just fine in MySQL can't possibly succeed in uh, in SQLite just because it's trying to sub sort uh, lowercase and uppercase letters and it never comes out the right way. Um, things that I've added in, there is a section here for the drivers just to give you an overview of what drivers are installed in the system. Um, drivers, because of their nature, they don't, there's no way to enable them. You, you enable them by dropping them into the slash drivers directory or into, there's some that come in core drivers. And if they, if it exists there, then it's enabled. It's just kind of an implicit thing. Um, similarly, there's no way to disable it without just pulling it out. You can, uh, this is not yet ready because I don't have the support yet up on silkscreencms.org. Uh, but at some point, you're going to be able to download and install new drivers in the same way that you're going to be able to download, that you can download and install uh, modules and layouts and, and other things. Um, one of the things I had to do in order to introduce that, you'll notice that down here, there's a little silkscreen logo. And if you go into functionality here, install new modules. There's a little backdrop logo and, and whatnot here. And that's just saying that if you're installing this, it's coming from the backdrop repository of modules versus the silkscreen repository of modules. Uh, there's some changes in project that need to be made in order to allow project to pull from multiple repositories. Uh, this might in the future allow for third-party repositories to, to offer stuff. Could turn it into almost like a marketplace for modules. We'll see how that works out. So what is the advantage of using different databases to drive this? Certain use cases. Well, first off, there's just some shops that prefer to use Postgres because they're more comfortable with it. It tends to scale a little bit better. Uh, for most sites, unless you're running something that is like archive.org sized, where you just have enormous databases, MySQL will work just fine. Uh, I have worked with some companies that not for a web thing, for a different document repository management system. Um, they tried running it with MySQL. It had so many rows that it, the database just fell over and they had to shift over to Postgres. Um, SQL Lite is useful in a lot of cases for demos because it's nice and small and, and you don't need to have an actual database engine. It's the library. Uh, the PDO library itself is directly opening the, the database and, and reading it. It doesn't really scale well for a, a public facing site, but if you just wanted to create a Docker image with your code and that database, that would be an easy thing to distribute. And then whoever is pulling it down doesn't need to do some Docker compose to get a database uh, Docker image as well as a PHP Docker image. It's just one thing, it's, it's nicely encapsulated. So those would be a couple of reasons why you would use a different database. So it's mostly dependent upon what the host provides. The the host, um, like the, the hosting service, the, the server? Yeah, wherever you're hosting it. I, I, they don't want to use MySQL. They want to use one of these other databases. Oh. Well, Salva Sri, this kind of solves one of the issues that you were having. See how you had trouble setting up your MySQL database and so on. But what it would solve, it would solve setting it up on your local. That's what uh, John means by that, by demo sites. Like it, you wouldn't be able to use it for a live site. You could, but it's not secure. It's not, it's not going to be performant. But it would be less trouble for you to set it up on your local because it's not actually a, a database. It's writing on a file on your system. Right. So if you're setting up a, a website for a kiosk in a shopping mall or something, then you might want to use SQLite because it's nice and light. Um, if you're somehow going to take this and wrap it in, I don't know if you would you actually drop it into an electron wrapper and create an app out of it. You might use SQLite as a backend database. SQLite is, near as I can tell, um, possibly the most installed database in the world, simply because all of our phones, most of the apps in it use SQLite as a backend. Uh, 
Uh, one of the other things that I added in, and this is going back to the config stuff that we started with. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can share a different window. Does this mean you could develop on silk screen and move it into backdrop? It's a drop in replacement as long as you're not doing something that is, you know, specific to to silk screen. Um, then yeah, you should be able to to do that easily. And I can't actually. I can. Huh. The browsers show up as things I can share with Zoom, but I can't actually share the uh, my terminal. So that's kind of annoying. But maybe I can do it a different way. While uh, John is figuring that out, I can also fill in some other good examples of what Silk Screen is doing and what Backdrop can't in particular and why these things are split. Um, so, so Backdrop decided to only support MySQL compatible database engines because it allows us certain optimizations in some places. Like John mentioned, there's like case sensitivity issues in other databases that MySQL doesn't really care about case sensitivity when it executes its queries. Um, and that's made it so that in some places we are writing specifically MySQL based queries that gets us more performant results for everyone that's using MySQL. And when you abstract things out to make them generic for compatibility with Postgres or SQLite, um, you end up impacting the performance of all backdrop users to make it so that you're accommodating those database engines. And so our decision within backdrop was, well, if we can make uh, backdrop faster for 99% of backdrop websites, because they're the ones they're all using MySQL, we should just directly support MySQL and drop support for these other database engines. Uh, and that makes it so that backdrop for the majority use case is going to be faster and optimized towards MySQL. Um, but there's situations in which scaling or your infrastructure, or like John mentioned, like uh, preferences of your infrastructure team, or maybe you're running a Postgres based website because Postgres has tremendously better geospatial support. Like Postgres can do absolutely amazing stuff with mapping that MySQL is not capable of. And it might be beneficial for you to run your entire project on Postgres rather than have two separate databases. So there's reasons why you might need or want Postgres or another database engine. But for most users of Backdrop, MySQL is the only one that they need. And it makes sense for us to optimize towards that uh, majority use case. Also, if you're using MySQL, then you don't have to worry about um, capital and lowercase uh, confusion, right? Yeah, one of, one of the... Uh, friendlier. It'd be friendlier. Right. One, one of the most famous examples of this is the login query, that when you log in, uh, the username is case insensitive in Drupal. Um, but uh, when the query is executed, uh, casting the, the string that the user typed into lowercase and then comparing it against uh, your MySQL column, you have to specifically say lower use a MySQL function on the entire column of usernames. And that makes it so that MySQL can't use an index on the username. So it has to run through the entire table manually to check the username. That's a really sil silly example, but it makes it so that the difference between logging in on a site with a million users, checking if the username and password matches can change from like a, uh, 
like a 0 0.0001 millisecond in MySQL, if you run that function on it, then it can take like three to five seconds. It's a huge difference. And in a way that really can impact users if logging in is slow, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. <laughs> Uh, as a happy side effect, you know, reducing it down to just supporting one database meant only one database to test, not three. Uh, only one to support, not three. Um, it, when you know you guys were just starting out, you had rather limited technical support teams. You know, it was basically what just Nate and Jen, right? I mean, it was how many others were uh, helping you out at the at the beginning? So you know, having having uh, not having to apply your resources to three different databases and keeping them all up probably made things a lot easier in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. not not just core too. Like um, Contrib is notorious for like theoretically supporting Postgres, but then writing SQL queries that don't work. And so also, uh, you know, trying to make it so that all of the Contrib stuff for uh, MySQL works on multiple databases puts a burden on the Contrib community too. So. Um, limiting it to one makes it a little bit easier on all developers. Yeah, that's that is a very true statement. Uh, when I started doing stuff in Drupal, the first dozen or so patches and, and issues that I put into the uh, Drupal.org issue queues were all about this doesn't work in Postgres. Here's a patch that makes it work. And nine times out of ten, it was just changing single and double quotes to get it to be a proper SQL. I think one of uh, occasionally it was. Maybe one of the first patches I ever got in Drupal was somebody providing that patch to me, telling me my module didn't work in Postgres, and I wonder if it was you. I'm going to go check. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. Uh, so when I did the config stuff, creating them as, as uh, drivers, there's config file, which is just the standard thing that you guys always use. There's config database. That's also in the silkscreen core, but then I created a few others for um, as contrib drivers. Uh, there's config memory, which is before you guys had the overrides in uh, 1.16, uh, this is how I was able to do some memory overrides. And in order to get that to really work, you needed to use config layered. And let's see if I think it's in. So for doing memory, uh, in-memory overrides of config stuff, the way that you set it up was set a config directory of memory to point to a specific memory blob, uh, set your active files to whatever it normally is. And then the actual active directory is a layered directory of memory on top of active files. And what that would do, and then you, you set up your config with a the blob and whatever overrides you need. Um, the layered driver would look at each of the layers as it's reading, and the first one that actually had a config item in it is what it would use. So here it would read it for a system core site name, but anything else that was in system core or in any other bucket, it would drop down to active files. It would also, when you're writing, take a look and see which of these are considered immutable config directories. Uh, memory reports itself as not mutable. You set it at the beginning and it's just set. So it would skip that and go down and write it to active files instead. There's a third one that is not listed here that I was trying to get to work earlier today, config session that stores all the stuff in a in a session key in, in your, your local session. So you make changes, it'll show up for you, but it won't show up for anyone else in the world because it's only local to your session. Uh, this would be really useful if you're trying to set up, you know, here's a, a backdrop or a silkscreen site. Uh, you guys have full admin access to it, do whatever you like. They can make all the changes they want and the next guy that comes along doesn't see a single bit of it. So it's, it's not like they could post up a whole bunch of uh, nefarious links or, or uh, nasty stuff like that. They can, but they're the only ones that see it, so nobody cares. Just for a, a way of doing a, a demo, a public demo that, that could be kind of useful. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite working right now because 
in Bootstrap, configuration is like the first thing that happens and the session is way down like sixth or seventh in the list. And the, a lot of stuff gets read well before we actually get to config session is what I was finding. Um, I'm going to keep working at it, see if I can find a way to get it to work, but it's it's not there yet. Plus, uh, it, it, was, it, it, it would work only for the period that the person is logged in. As soon, soon as they try to see something as anonymous, it wouldn't work, right? That's correct. Yeah, if they try to go to anonymous, it would stop working. Or if they open it up in another browser, it would stop working. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? I, in your list of drivers there, I noticed there's no config database, but that's one of the things that you said that distinguishes Silkscreen from Backdrop. Is that is that in uh, Silkscreen Core? Yes, uh, Silkscreen Core has config database in it, and the default is for active is DB active config. And can you describe what uh, benefits you have by storing config in the database rather than using the file storage that Backdrop uses? If you're trying to copy down everything from a site, grabbing the database as a single object, as a single artifact, makes it just a little bit easier than grabbing that and a config zip. It's not impossible to do both, and, and it's not that much more difficult. But just having one artifact instead of two just makes it a little bit easier. It keeps everything nice and, and tidy. Uh, if you're running something that is a uh, a site that is that needs multiple PHP heads, multiple web heads, and, and application servers, you write you write to the database, and it's immediately available to all of the other heads. Uh, if you're writing to a bunch of files, and you either need some NFS style shared backend that everything goes to or you need something that is doing some syncing between them. Um, um, NFS, I found to be kind of on the slow side. So the, uh, are, you saying, uh, yeah, are you saying that you're completely overriding the CMI concept, or do you require uh, database, sorry, config input and export the same way that Drupal does? Like if someone wanted to, um, to use GitHub to sort of like deploy their code, you cannot do it that if that's stored directly in the database or, and, and how Drupal works around that is that they have that config input thing that people put in their CIs, which when they deploy, it reads from the files into the database. Uh, config sync, uh, I think config sync is still here, isn't it? Yeah, but am I saying, how have you implemented it? Have you sort of like uh, overridden the, the whole CMI concept and you're storing everything in the database and the expectation is for users to just sync the databases? Or are you supporting um, like a workflow would be supported only by allowing people to do uh, input and export? Uh, config sync still works the way that that you would think it, the fact that it's writing to a database in, instead of a bunch of files doesn't really change it. So yeah, if you're doing a, a full import or even just a single import of, of a piece, the writing it to the database is no different than writing it to a, to a file. In fact, in the database, it stores it as a JSON file and, and uh, stores the, I think it's the C time, because that's what was being used for, uh, for the files to check and see what's, what's the latest. Um, it is you know, as much as possible quirk for quirk compatible with uh, with the file version. Um, the for other kinds of config input, though, uh, if you're trying to run something that is, let's say you've got a dev and a stage and a prod site that you're working on. And you want to have a few overrides for the dev site that you don't see in, in prod. You might end up using config layered with two database configs or with a file and a database config and just put the overrides in, in the top layer. And that way you get, uh, in Drupal 8, they call it config split. And 
yeah. you know, config layer here would be able to uh, accomplish largely the same thing. Um, what were we looking at? Migration drivers. So I think that's most of the about the config side. Uh, the next step up is going to be getting some caching modules in there. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that's going to be a little bit easier to get some things in there. Uh, I'm already working on the memcache one. It's not ready for prime time, but uh, it's it should be. I'm hoping by the end of the year I'll have that done. Uh, one of the things that I want to do with it is make it so that the caching modules can be configured inside of Drupal itself rather than, if you remember trying to set up memcache in Drupal 7, you had to go into settings.php and set up a whole bunch of uh, arrays and whatnot to tell what buckets to put everything into. And that was just kind of a, even for people who are technical, it was a pain. So if, if we can find some way to put that in into here, then I think we can make it a lot easier to manage a, a, a site. Because caching is going to be entirely local to that PHP, the, the application server, um, what I'm probably going to end up doing is creating a con separate config bucket for cache modules. So they will all be calling config cache uh, to get their configuration that way. Because the caching also has to happen well before anything else is loaded, we know that the files can be read. We can do that. We can't necessarily read from other things, uh, from databases or from session or, or from anything else that requires a higher bootstrap level. Um, fortunately, because we've got the config management interface here, all that is is just creating another config type. And So in the same way, you know, you'd say config directories cache and point it to a files to a file directory, and then the caching modules would all be able to load their configuration locally before everything is fully bootstrapped. Check and see if there's a, a already cached copy of the page that you're looking at, and send it on without having to fully bootstrap backdrop. Uh, any questions on that? If you're looking for an opening, or I'm looking for an opening to ask other questions, and that's uh, uh, what uh, sites have you launched that are running uh, Silkscreen? And I, I mean, obviously, you're the maintainer of it, so you probably have good reason to have the ability to have the flexibility to change whatever you want within it. Um, but what uh, were the circumstances that uh, require that drove you to make Silkscreen so that you could run these sites? So maybe sites you're running first, and then why Silkscreen? Uh, sites I'm running, uh, there is a company up in New Jersey that does a lot of higher ed training um, for actually for like faculty and staff. You know, it's, it's a you need to know about Title IX impact or uh, the impact of certain laws on how you run your campus. And this is a, a preview and, and a, a primer on, on how to handle it. It's not exactly legal advice. It's as close as they can get to legal advice without actually having any legal obligations for it. Um, and then each of these sites have got a like a, a quiz and a, and a little certification that they get out of it. Um, There hasn't been anything that has absolutely critically needed it. It's been more that storing the the config in the database has just been has just made more sense to me as a as a DevOps guy, and so that's what I've been going with. Um, I can't really say that there's any critical one that has been doing it. 
And I kind of figured that if I have the, the need for it, then there are probably other people out there who need it too. And so make it available for them. Yep. Sounds right. <laughs> I, I've also, if you don't mind me in, injecting my own stories here. Um, Go ahead. That there's lots of um, sites that I've, I've built that have had like two to all the way up to 16 web servers. Um, but they usually only come down to like, you know, one database server and maybe a replica. So when you get these like highly redundant, I call it high availability server setups that um, the database usually have it, has its own redundant protections built in and also ways to scale it really well. Uh, network connectivity between the database and web service is also usually really pretty good. And then the file systems are not well synchronized, like not nearly as, as um, trustworthy as the databases. Databases are guaranteed to have, um, you know, when I write this file, nobody else is going to be able to read the value until it's fully written. And then everybody else waits while it writes and then, then they're allowed to read afterwards. And file systems don't have that kind of protection on them. Um, and so when you have these, um, 16 web servers, if they're all reading from a shared file system, there's a combination of like um, problems that the file system can't fully be trusted. And it's also usually not as fast as a database driven system. Um, but again, like in the world of backdrop, we're targeting like these like shared hosts and sites that are running off of a single web server is the primary use case. And the speed advantage of using like a local file system is usually like, you know, for a, a, a site that's running on a single server or a shared server, Backdrop's approach is really great from a performance perspective, possibly even better than using a database. Um, but when you start scaling, like scalability becomes more important than pure performance speed. And that's where database config could really shine. Yeah, and I remember in the Drupal, even in the Drupal six days, there were some, there are a lot of, you know, the, the smaller sites that uh, is the sort of thing that Backdrop is targeting. Uh, and I certainly worked on a number of those. And then there's some sites that were just enormous. Um, I'm thinking like, you know, the White House, I'd go kind of things that where they had to really be able to scale up. And Drupal was able to do it, you know, miraculously, people managed to take was a fairly simple framework and really push it to to the nines. Um, so yeah, I kind of thought that silk screen would be a, if you need to be able to do a little bit more, then it's it's got that scalability built into it. Um, also, Silkscreen has served me in a lot of discussions where was, there was debate on why or, uh, or people saying that it was bad working Drupal and so on, uh, or they thought that it was going to be bad for the community. And uh, I'm always saying, hey, uh, Backdrop was also forked and we have very good relations. So <laughs> I don't know what that deal's about. So um, it's sort of like proving a point that, yeah. Forks are great. Yes, they are. Awesome. I, 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 so I, I want to join in too and just say how great it is actually because uh, because John, uh, as, as one of our uh, most technically savvy contributors to the Backdrop project, um, sometimes I've seen you use Silkscreen as an incubator um, to test out functionality that uh, later you provide patches to backdrop core that are like, when I was working on silkscreen, I found this thing, or there's this one line within backdrop core that if it were changed would allow silkscreen to provide flexibility. And so there's a lot of stuff that because silkscreen exists, we are expanding flexibility to things not that are not just silkscreen, but to the community at large. And silkscreen runs into all of these corner cases of weird 
uh, extension points that we otherwise wouldn't really be thinking about. But through Silkscreen, we get uh, extendability and backdrop cores that make it so that because we have more compatibility compatibility with Silkscreen, we have more flexibility with everybody else that might do something similar in the future. So it's been really beneficial to backdrop core to have a fork, which is crazy, but that's probably because of the way that you coordinate and work um, so effectively with the backdrop core team as well. I also love that it's like a up, like a upscale fork too, where it's like, we're really focused on the small sites, but the fact that there's like, oh, do you have a big site? Don't worry, there's silkscreen also seems like a really great um, counterpoint to the like, oh, backdrop is just for the little guys. You're like, no, 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 it's fine. We have a press flow. <laughs> so uh, I love that about it too. Sorry about that. Yeah. And when I'm trying to do some of the uh, more flexible pieces in Silkscreen, uh, I am generally trying to find, is there a way that I can do this such that I'm, I can, I'm not really impacting backdrop uh, and putting in really invasive patches? And sometimes it really is as simple as adding a uh, backdrop alter call in a particular function. I mean, it, it may take nothing more than that. And then, yeah, sometimes I also find the weird things in the testing uh, that, and just make the test a little bit more robust. There was one that my SQL, when it puts in the uh, records into a database, unless it has to split up some internal bucket, it's going to return them in exactly the same order. And we, the test was putting them in in a sorted order, and so they were coming out in a sorted order. Um, but that wasn't actually working on Postgres, I think it was. And so all I had to do was add a, a where clause, not a, an order by clause, into the test, and then everything worked. Um, I submitted that as a patch and actually swapped a couple of things around in the test data just to make sure that it would require the order by call clause in order to, to kick in. So yeah, just little things here and there that, because MySQL is really forgiving you guys just don't even see. Yep, things that only kind of worked by luck and assumption that MySQL is so consistent with its quote luck and, uh, and assumption that uh, we were doing things uh, implicitly. And now uh, after some of those changes to make it compatible with Postgres, we're, we're improving the code that is executed in MySQL, making it explicit. Yeah, real great example. Well, John, do you have anything else you'd, you'd like to show in particular? Um, I don't think so. I think I've covered just about everything. I'm looking at my notes here to see if there's anything else. Um, no, I think that's about it. All right. Do we have any uh, questions from audience members? Anything you guys like to add? You guys can type in the chat if you want or on mute. Jason, potentially, you, I know you're unmuted. No. Nope. <laughs> Remuted. Double muted. I was double oh, there we go. That's what it was. <laughs> Uh, I hate it when I do that. Um, so I have a question regarding the caching. You've got the cache drivers, and um, I think it was 1.16 um, entity cache was um, added to backdrop core. Did that affect your cache drivers at all, or did we able to just slide wrong with the changes without any modifications? They didn't cause any issues in the testing, so I actually didn't even notice that there was some cache layer. <laughs> changes made in 1.16. Now I'm going to have to go back and take a look at it. OK. <laughs> that's interesting. Maybe that's good. Maybe that means that's, you know, this like all yeah. this stuff is just kind of flowing correctly. Yeah, I was about to say that. For the, no news, no news, good news. It's like you didn't the, even notice it. <laughs> for the yeah. most part, it was just adding some new bins. 
So like it didn't change any of the API functions that the caching used. Yeah, I wonder about that, John. Like if um, if we're adding new cache bins, uh, the update to 116 added a new database table to hold the cached entities, ca cache entity table. And what happens when you're using one of these alternative data or alternative cache engines when Core adds a new database table because it is the database backend by default? What happens with uh, the Pressflow cache backends, does, does it automatically adopt them or does it use the database for that one cache entry or cache bin until you convert it over to use the other one? I guess it would kind of depend on how it's being done in the, uh, in the cache layer. If it's if the machine independent or the, the cache independent code uh, just adds another entry then it'll probably just flow through cleanly. If there's something specific that has to be done at the actual cache layer in order to implement it, then it would, it might not even work at all. It might just keep coming back with nothing in the cache. So I guess it would be, I'll have to take a look at the, uh, the cache API and see, you know, how much of it is, uh, storage independent versus, you know, the storage dependent side. Great. Um, any other questions? Well, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll probably turn off this live stream. Uh, I think Is, it's Joseph, do you want to add? Have you, um, do you have like plans for a cache um, backend using Redis. I noticed you had memcache, but I didn't see Redis in there. Redis is certainly banging around in the back of my head. I've been using it for some uh, actual Drupal sites lately. And um, while it's kind of a interesting beast to, to tame, um, it is certainly a very, very fast caching layer and, and I do want to use it. Uh, so yeah, Redis is going to be the next one after I get memcache working. Okay. And yeah, because I think Pantheon provides a Redis server with a gig of RAM for every paid site. Then that would be a, a strong reason to make that a higher priority. Um, kind of a funny story on the, the naming of Silkscreen. When I first started to do it, I was thinking that I wanted to have a track along like Pressflow, and this was Backdrop. And so what was the name I was going to use with it? Well, I took Backdrop and I took Pressflow and inverted them together and came up with Backflow. That's an awful name for anything. And I didn't realize that, you know, it kind of dawned on me after I'd bought the domains. Um, and, you know, opened it up to my friends and said, you know, I need a name for this project. and. Uh, a friend of mine was trying to do some custom t-shirts and mentioned some silk screening and another one of my friends who was in that conversation, I said, wait, that would be a great name for the CMS. Yeah, agreed. I actually think silk screen is in some ways uh, more like a compelling and appealing name than, than backdrop, which is much more passive uh, in, its, in its naming. But yeah, but that's so funny, backflow. <laughs> absolutely horrible. <laughs> I just think of, never mind, I don't need to talk about what I think of. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good, yeah. Um, yeah, and a friend of mine just was, uh, he appreciated that all of our names have got a very theatrical look to them. You know, a backdrop is, you know, that silk screen is also a theatrical term. Um, so, you know, you guys pulled it because you were pulling from Drupal uh, and drop and being backward compatible with that. And so it just kind of became merged from that or migrated from that to uh, more theatrical theming. Yeah. Yeah. Branding, not our strong suit uh, in the, in the backdrop community, but there are some interesting opportunities for <laughs> for extending the, the 
kind of the design and like branding language that we use right now it's still pretty um vague you know like we don't we don't really pursue the uh particular theme but it, the potential is there yeah uh, the logo came from a friend of mine that I knew in college who was just a fantastic artist. And, you know, the one thing I told him is that I wanted the colors to be cyan, magenta, and yellow. And if you could, you know, run with that, and, and that's what he came up with. He came up with, like, four or five different ones, and this is the one that I like the best. With regards to the thing that you mentioned about Redis, so the the agency that I work for, they they have this major project which is GovCMS. I keep mentioning it. It's the it's a distribution of Drupal that the Australian government has chosen as its sort of like a platform for government sites, and they're using Redis as a service. Uh, at some point when they were contemplating, it was just before June, July, before the release of um, D9, and uh, the tech lead at that point, because I kept mentioning Backdrop, said, "Oh, have you ported?" GovCMS to backdrop yet. And he, he said it as a joke and it's always at the back of my head, but because they're using, they're using Redis, it might have to be a, a port into seal screen instead of back, you know, backdrop. Uh, so yeah, you have a potential tester there as well. When I get the uh, Redis module, at least into a beta, I'll reach out to you. Let's yeah, just, can. just yeah, drop, a line, drop a line to let us know that you've done that. Yeah, I also yeah. think that's a good candidate for including in the Pantheon upstream, uh, the, the module anyway. So I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Yeah, the next thing I want to do when I get a couple caching modules in is run some performance tests and see just you know how much it improves things. See what the numbers work out to. Talking about performance, I've noticed that our tests are taking slightly longer to run now than they used to a couple of years ago, maybe a minute more, both PSP 5 and 7. Um, and Nate has done some really good uh, stats. It was, I think that the goal was to compare it to Drupal 8, but maybe we should at some point when we have the capacity run those again. You think it could be the 75 contributed modules we added to core? <laughs> <laughs> could be. There have been a number, you, you guys do have a lot more tests than uh... But like two, three years ago. Awesome. So that would explain you know, it taking a little bit longer to run. Yeah, talking about tests, I would like us, I wish that I could speak test. Uh, I would like us to do, I think that's an, an approach that Drupal is taking. So they first do a patch that actually introduces the test with a failure and then they fix it so that the, the, the failure is green. Or, sorry, that the test passes. In other words, I would like us. To ideally move to that test driven development yep yes yeah. uh is there any support in in the test for uh have you guys used bhat it's a behavior driven development it's uh, the gherkin style of, of testing yeah have you guys got that working in uh backdrop yet i don't think Sorry, I wasn't sure, Craig, if you were going to that. Um, we certainly are not pursuing it in core development because uh, um, I, I, th I think that we would get a, lot, a heck of a lot of value out of if we um, uh, incorporated better testing engines, like ones that leverage Selenium or, or WebDriver or Chrome Driver or something like that, so that we could have browser driven tests. I think that is an area in which our testing is uh, lacking capabilities. Um, and at one point, the hat was people's default way of achieving said goal that like the hat made it so that we could do browser based testing. Um, but now I think that there's better, um, maybe not better, but uh, alternatives that uh, we could pursue that would be consistent with the current testing format. So basically simple test driven where it's it's coding driven testing um, that would make it so that we don't introduce an, a different syntax or a new syntax. But I don't know, there are different goals, I guess, consistency with the testing that we have right now that could be web browser driven, I think is one goal and it's a lower barrier than um, 
using BAHAT testing like across the board because then now what kind of tests do you use in which places um, it being a different syntax. Um, Gherkin also is basically an abstraction on top of a, um, you know, the extensions that you put on top of it. So it's not really you just type in whatever you want. It's like you type in something that matches regular expressions that then executes something that you wrote custom, <laughs> you know? So, mm -hmm. so in, in, in many ways, like it, it actually makes testing more complicated rather than less, but it does make reading the tests a lot more, um, a lot more grokkable. So yeah, that's where I had the most success with it is, you know, being able to say, here's our test and showing it to some clients who don't have the, the programming background. And they start reading through it, it's like, oh, I understand exactly what this is doing, you know, until we start getting the kind of wacky uh, behat tests that are calling out specific CSS classes or uh, IDs and, and doing that whole XREF. Because once you start adding XREF into behat, it just stops being readable. Well, I, I don't want to get too far off topic and we only have one minute left. So I think I'm yeah. going to say, yeah, thank you, John, for giving this presentation. Thanks. We really very much thank appreciate you. the presentation. Yes, I have to jump out. And the work that you've done in, in silk screen. So thank you very much. And I'll end the meeting and uh, yeah, see you guys around on the rest of the conference. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and thank you all for showing up today. Thanks. Thanks.